Acts 1 afterward. So go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Go down to verse 36. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you because you're good to us. We need you, God, like never before. We need you, God, like never before. You know what's going on in our individual lives and you know what we have need of. And some of us are in some circumstances that if you don't deliver, we won't be delivered. So I pray that you speak life today. Give us clarity and clear direction. We pray for the joy of the Lord as our strength. We bind the hand of the enemy on every side. We come against every distracting spirit. Every text messaging spirit. Every sleepy spirit. Facebook, Instagram. Don't let the devil rock us to sleep. But let us hear what the spirit has to say to the church. And we decree victory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew 26. Uh, I'll read quickly. We'll start at 36. One of the things we have to be careful of, uh, especially living in the Western world, uh, we, we have to make sure we don't allow uh, the calendar event to determine what we preach about as ministers of the gospel. In the Western world, we got to make sure we don't allow the calendar event to determine when we can preach things. For instance, I don't want the calendar event to make me feel like I can only talk about the birth of Jesus at Christmas time. Because the birth of Jesus is good any day of the week. And so I want you to remember that as we read this scripture here. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 36, y'all got it? Uh, then cometh Jesus with them unto the place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What you could not watch with me one hour. Can I say it like I believe he really said it? What? You couldn't watch with me for just one hour. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Go to Acts, Acts 1 and verse 8. Acts 1, verse 8. Acts 1, verse 8. When you got it, say, I got it. Acts 1 and 8 says very simply, but he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, in Matthew 26, we see God, we see Jesus, the Son of God, uh, uh, in the most turbulent time of his life. And in Acts, we see the results of what he was able to conquer in the garden. I want to preach just for a few minutes from the subject, his passion released the power. Look at somebody and say, I got the power. I got the power. Hey Amen. Be seated in his presence. His passion, his passion, his passion released the power. It is imperative to note, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that uh, we celebrate today. We are rejoicing today. We are satisfied in the fact that our salvation uh, has been made available to us. We are ecstatic because it was made available to you and I, salvation, uh, through the obedience of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our salvation was made available because Jesus was obedient. Romans 5 and 19 simply declares, for as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Somebody say righteous. It's, it's interesting because Jesus was fully aware as to what his ultimate mission was here on earth. He was fully aware. Uh, he, he had a clear understanding of why he ultimately came uh, to the earth to be born uh, in the flesh. He, he understood why he was here. And, and oftentimes, uh, Jesus would use what I like to call intentional language uh, to anybody who may have been unclear as to why he ultimately came. He, he, he used intentional language. He didn't leave any gray areas when it came to his ultimate purpose of coming to the earth. He would use intentional language for anybody that may have been unclear of why he really came to earth. Uh, he used intentional language in, in Luke 2 and 49 when he said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? I came to be about his business. In, in Matthew 12, he used intentional language. And he says, uh, whoever does the will of the father, uh, the same as my mother, the same as my brother and, and my sister. I'm intentional of why I'm here. In John 2 and 4, you see intentional language again uh, when he spoke to his mother and said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour or the ultimate reason why I'm here has not yet come. And finally, in John 2, 19, we, say, uh, we see intentional language again when, when Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that uh, the obedience of Jesus, his, his obedience, it was intentional. Uh, Jesus didn't slip up on being obedient. His obedience was intentional, and his obedience was intentional because the atonement uh, was a necessity. Uh -huh. he, his obedience was intentional because the atonement was a necessity. We needed to be atoned. And, and let us understand very quickly uh, uh, that the atonement was a necessity uh, not because God needs to save us in order for him to remain God. The atonement is not a necessity uh, that God needs to deliver us so that he could keep his God status. That is not why uh, the atonement was a necessity, but rather the atonement is a necessity as a consequence of God's choice to save us. The atonement is a necessity as a consequence of God's choice to save you and I. It is considered by some theologians, if you will, to be the consequent absolute necessity. It's the consequent absolute necessity. In other words, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, uh, God, in his love, he decided to save you and I. Once he decided to save you and I, uh, uh, and he loved on us, then he said, I can only do it through the death of my son, Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to save them, and I'm going to save them because I love them. You know, when you love somebody, you're going to do something, if you can, about their situation. You're going to do something about their condition. And so Jesus said, God is saying here, I love them, and because I love them, I have to save them. But the only way for me to save them is through the death of my only son, Jesus. Here it is. He says, I love them. And every time I think about God's love toward me, I'm impressed even the more. Because you and I, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we love people based on what we see. Uh, we love people based on what we can get from them. We love people based on the way they make us feel. But Jesus' love, God God's love is a different type of love because uh, as good as you look today and you're smelling good and you got it going on today, Ezekiel uh, clarifies very clearly the condition we were in when God saw us and wanted to love us. Ezekiel said you were polluted in your own blood. You were drowning. We were dying. We were good for nothing in our own blood. And everybody else walked past us. Everybody else wanted nothing to do with us but this great God that we've been serving and praising today he reached down into a polluted place and lifted you and I 
out of the miry clay, washed us with his blood, and said, I want something to do with you. Most of us would ignore folk uh, that didn't look, smell, and act the way we think they should. But God, and I'm so glad he did, God saw us in our polluted ways and said, I can do something about the condition that you are in, and I'm going to save them from a burning hell. So his love, it made it necessary for him to save us. But as a consequence of him saving us, he said, Jesus, you got to die for them. If, if I'm going to save them, then you must die for them. And so now Jesus had to become uh, what some consider the propitiation. He, he had to become then the go-between. Jesus had to become the propitiation between God and man. It is Jesus now who stands between God and man who will shift God's wrath toward us because of sin into God's favor toward us. Y'all stay with me. It is Jesus who becomes the go-between who shifted the wrath of God uh, into the favor of God on our life. And now there's an argument here uh, by some theologians, some men of study uh, who would debate us and, and they would say that Jesus really uh, could not be the propitiation. He, he really is not that. That's not his role. That's really not what Jesus is. He is not the go-between between God and man. And they say this because uh, they look at God as being a loving God and a loving father. And so they said, if God is upset with man, it would be inconsistent with his character. Why would God create man and then get mad at man and want to destroy them? So they said, Jesus cannot be the propitiation because God is not a God of wrath and it's inconsistent with who he is for God to be mad at you and I. Uh, let me argue that point for just 30 seconds here because uh, we must always remember, ladies and gentlemen, there is always, thank you, an eternal and unchangeable requirement in the holiness and justice of God that sin must be paid for. I don't care where you are. I don't care where you go. It's unchangeable and it's eternal. God said wherever sin is, I require a payment. Somebody owes me when sin is in the camp. Somebody owes me when I see sin in your life. And I deserve a payment whenever sin shows up. And it's unchangeable. I don't care if it's the 19th, 20th, or 21st century. Sin has to be paid for. And although God is a loving God, and although God is a loving father. If Jesus does not become the propitiation, then God would be forced to love us to death. He would love us to hell because the wages of sin is death. And if there's no payment, I'll love you to death. If there's no payment, I'll have to love you to hell. But I don't know about y'all, but I thank God God for Jesus. I, I don't know. Maybe Jesus has become old school for us. Uh, maybe we're more into social media, but I'm still into Jesus. And uh, I thank God for Jesus. And, and so it is Jesus now who becomes the compromise. It is Jesus uh, who becomes the propitiation. He becomes uh, the solace. And it is Jesus who declares that I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. I didn't come for you to die. I've come for you to have life. I need you to declare to somebody next to you and say, you shall not die. Tell them, but live, but live, but live. You said it like you waiting on a funeral. Find you somebody that you want to see the life out of and say, you shall not die. 
but live and declare the works of the Lord. And so Jesus said, if I showed up, I didn't show up for death and that death being eternal, but I showed up to give you life and life more abundantly. And so then it is Jesus now, the Christ, who is the solace between God and man. Jesus is the solace between God and man. And Jesus has to live a life of perfect obedience in order to earn righteousness for you and I. Jesus has to live a perfect life of obedience. What are you saying, little preacher? Well, I'm saying we cannot afford for Jesus to have a oops moment. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. We don't need Jesus to slip up right through here. We, we don't need Jesus to say my flesh just uh, overtook me and I had to do it. We don't need Jesus to say, well, God knows my heart. Uh, no, no, no. We need Jesus uh, to be perfect in obedience uh, because as he's obedient, he's earning righteousness for you and I. So, Jesus, we need you to hang in there. We need you to resist the devil on every hand. Uh, we need you, Jesus, to overcome the enemy and every temptation. I know the woman is pretty, Jesus, uh, but we need you to overcome it. We, we don't need you to sleep with her uh, because you're earning righteousness uh, uh, for some folk uh, and it's going to release some power if you hold on and be obedient. Jesus, uh, we don't need you to get drunk uh, and not remember what you did last night uh, uh, because you were going through and were having a pity party. We need you, Jesus, to hold on. Uh, we need you to live a life of perfect uh, obedience because uh, I need the power uh, so that one day I can look at the devil uh, and say if Jesus was able to overcome uh, that same power that was in him uh, resonates in me and so then uh, Jesus overcomes the devil we we need you to fight the devil look at it very quickly uh, with Jesus when the enemy showed up to tempt him uh, uh, he came to Jesus the enemy the devil and, and he said you know if you're really the son of God uh, take these stones and turn them to bread we don't need Jesus to listen to the devil because if he takes the stones and changes it to bread, then he will never become the bread of life. So we need you, Jesus, to hold on right through here. If, if Jesus took himself during that temptation and cast himself off of the high place so that the angels would come and rescue him at the devil's request, if he did that, if he cast himself off of the mountain, then you and I, ladies and gentlemen, would never be able to cast our cares upon him. So Jesus, I don't need you to go through suicidal thoughts. I need you to hold on because if you die, I die. If you don't make it, I don't make it. So don't cast yourself off just because the devil said cast yourself off. I'm here to tell somebody, don't you slit your wrist just because it's a little rough right through here. Don't you get no pills and try to overdose just because you got a little struggle in your life. If Jesus overcame the temptation, the same power that was in Jesus is on the inside of you. I hope I'm talking to some powerful folk today. I hope I ain't talking talking to no punks. I hope I ain't talking to some weak, scaredy cats. I hope I'm talking to some folk who will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil and say the same power that Jesus has. He has given it unto me. Somebody lift your hands and say power, power. And so then, Jesus, you can't take orders from the devil. Jesus, if you bow, if you bow to Satan at his request. He said, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. Jesus, we don't need you to bow at Satan. Don't bow before him. 
<laughs> don't bow. And you know, the scripture would suggest <laughs> that Satan did not want Jesus to lay prostrate before him. <laughs> That's not what he was asking. He, he just said, I just need you to go forward, bend forward just a, a little bit. <laughs> just give me a little something. <laughs> just let me smoke a little weed. <laughs> just let me go over her house for a little while. <laughs> just give me a little something to drink. <laughs> he said, we don't need you to lay before me. Just bend forward just a, a little bit. <laughs> and if Jesus bows uh, at the feet of Satan uh, and gets the kingdoms of this world, uh, then you and I will never be able to declare that the earth is the Lord's uh, and the fullness uh, thereof. <laughs> That's why Romans 5 says uh, that as sin hath reigned unto death, uh, even so might grace reign through righteousness uh, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ uh, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we cannot take our salvation for granted. Uh, we can't take it like a simple act in history uh, as if anybody could have did what Jesus did. Uh, we can't act like our salvation uh, is something of the past. Uh, we can't act like it's old school uh, and we don't do that no more. Uh, we can't treat it like it's something uh, that was good for the Bible, uh, but not good for the 21st century. Uh, God told me to tell you, uh, the same power that was in his scripture uh, is the same power that's in the earth realm today. Uh, and God said, I did too much for you. Uh, Jesus said, I took too much for you. Uh, I went through too much for you uh, to sit there and let the devil whoop upside your head uh, like you ain't got no power to defeat the enemy. Uh, get somebody a high five uh, and say, I got power. Uh, you gonna help me up, Doc. Uh, tell them I got real Holy Ghost power. Uh, I may not have a whole lot of muscles, uh, but I got me some power. Uh, I may not have a position, uh, but I got me some power. Uh, how you know you got power? Because uh, when I say Jesus, uh, the devil that came in one one way huh? got to leave seven ways huh? when I say Jesus huh? demons that try to bully me huh? they tremble when they hear his name huh? somebody open your mouth huh? and declare Jesus huh? I need you to say it again huh? open your mouth in this house huh? and declare Jesus you know what's interesting to me because you know I can see all of y'all right what is interesting to me is this the playoffs were a few months ago and LeBron James was being rooted for by some and booed by others whether you like LeBron or hate him you gave a verbal response something came out of your mouth to identify how you felt about LeBron. But then the little preacher asks you to open your mouth and say Jesus and you don't say nothing. But what happened during the winter time when your car was sliding down the highway? You didn't need me to tell you. You opened your mouth and said Jesus. Give somebody a high five. I uh, tell them I love to call them. Uh, now go to the next level and say I got to call her. I'll die if I don't call his name. I'll give up if I don't call his name. I'll take my life if I don't call his name. I need somebody one more time. Open up your mouth. What's his name? Come on, shout hallelujah. It is here now that this Jesus, that you I heard the Lord just say it. I just heard the Lord Bishop. He said, 20 of y'all that called my name, the thing you prayed for six days ago, I just shifted it for you. Because you opened up your mouth and you declared who I am. 
Look at somebody. Uh, say, that was me. Uh, uh, he just shifted it. Uh, I know how to get his attention. Uh, you can call your mama. Uh, you can call your job. Uh, you can call your prayer partner. Uh, but I'm going to call Jesus. Uh, and he's going to bring me out. Uh, get somebody a high five. Uh, say, he released the power. Uh, I need you to tell him like you got it. Uh, say, neighbor. Uh, he released the power. Uh, how did he release the power? Uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, we got to look at the psychology of the scripture. Uh, in Matthew uh, chapter number 26, uh, when you look at the psychology of it, uh, psychologists would declare to us uh, that when you know you're getting ready to die, uh, he says your body uh, goes through five changes uh, of impact pending death uh, psychologists say uh, when you know you're getting ready to leave this earth uh, you go through five physical uh, and psychological changes uh, the thing I love about the scripture is uh, Jesus showed us uh, how to respond uh, when we're getting ready to die uh, God I feel like running uh, Jesus said uh, he went through every phase uh, the psychologists talk about uh, in verse number 36 uh, y'all read it with me uh, Matthew 36 uh, verse number 26 uh, the first phase uh, of impending death uh, is the phase of isolation uh, somebody say isolation uh, in verse 36 y'all uh, Jesus said sit ye here uh, while I, I go yonder uh, and pray uh, there's gonna come a point in your life uh, you're gonna turn off Facebook uh, you're gonna turn off the TV uh, you're gonna turn off your telephone uh, and you're gonna say if I'm coming out of this uh, I'm only coming out uh, when I go yonder and pray uh, sometimes you gotta tell folk uh, I don't mean you no harm uh, but I'm going through something uh, and I need to isolate myself uh, so I can hear from God uh, and he can hear my voice uh, is there anybody in here uh, that ever had to isolate uh, had to seclude yourself uh, you weren't mad at nobody uh, but you knew deep down in your soul uh, that I need a touch uh, I need some one on one time uh, I don't want to be interrupted uh, by a nun praiser uh, so I go into my closet uh, and I have the freedom to call on her uh, without offending somebody uh, so Jesus isolated himself uh, and he didn't isolate himself uh, to go into uh, seclusion uh, but he isolated himself uh, to go into prayer uh, after he went uh, into isolation uh, in verse 38 uh, he shifted uh, into depression uh, for he said in 38 uh, my soul uh, is exceeding sorrowful uh, even unto death uh, what you talking about preacher uh, it says it right here uh, that Jesus had to struggle uh, with depression in his life uh, and I'm so glad uh, he had to struggle with it uh, cause every now and then uh, even though I preach uh, all over the country uh, every now and then uh, the trials of life uh, they get so rough uh, that I got to struggle uh, with depression uh, and you sitting there acting like uh, all of your days are sunny uh, but I know uh, there's some time in your life uh, when the cloud comes uh, and you say Lord uh, what's going on in here uh, I'm glad he suffered uh, so when I suffered uh, I can relate uh, and he can relate uh, to what I'm going through uh, shake your neighbor's hand uh, say neighbor uh, 
Jesus has been touched with our infirmities. What you saying, preacher? There is nothing in your life that you're going through that he has not experienced. There was nothing in your life that you're fighting with that he has not fought. And if he made it, somebody say, I'm going to make it. He went from isolation to depression, from depression to bargaining. In verse 39, he said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup let it pass from me. Jesus, y'all, tried to bargain. He said, God, I know there's another way that you can get me out of this. You know some y'all, look at Jesus. He didn't just say, heavenly God, great creator, the only wise one. When you're going through something, you get real intimate in your relationship. He said, my daddy, my father, find another way to get me out of this. He tried to bargain with him. And if y'all tell the truth today, there's been some times in your life when you tried to bargain. You said, Lord, if you just get me out of this, I promise you, I ain't gonna never do it again. I ain't got no real folk in the house. You bargain with God. Say, if you bless me, I promise I'll spend money right. If you heal me, I promise you I'll eat right. He tried to bargain with her from isolation to depression, from depression to bargaining. And now we move to the fourth phase after bargaining and it didn't work. Jesus got angry. He got upset. Walked back to the disciples. Found them sleep in the most troubled time in his life. And said, what? Y'all couldn't pray with me for just one hour. Is there anybody in here ever been going through? And the folk you thought were with you. The folk you thought had your back. When you call them, they will sleep. When you call them, they were busy. When you call them, they ignored you. But I'm so glad that when I call them and they don't answer, I got a direct line to my God. I can call him whenever I'm in trouble. He went, y'all, from isolation to depression, from depression to bargaining, from bargaining to anger. But the last phase Jesus went through is the same place we got to get to. Jesus said, I got to accept what I got to go through. In verse 42, he said, if this cup may not pass, except I drink it, then thou will be done. God told me to tell you, whatever you're going through, get to a place in your life that you can testify and say, whatever my lot thou has caused me to say, it is well. If they gonna take the house, take it. It is well. You gonna take the job, take it. It is well. You gonna take my car, take it. It is well. Some of y'all, y'all don't like that. 
Because you can only praise her with the house. But is there anybody in here that still remember how to praise him with the broken pieces? How to praise him with an apartment? What to praise him in a rental car? How to praise him in the unemployment line? Lift your voice. Open your mouth and praise. Lift your hands. I'm going to my seat. Shout hallelujah. Shout glory. I'm getting ready to close. Jesus told me to tell you. He said, look at where I got the victory. He said, look at it. I said, where did you get it, God? Jesus said, I got the victory in the garden of Gethsemane. I said, that's good, God. He said, you ain't getting it. He said, they consider me to be the last Adam. And the last Adam got the victory in the garden. I said, all right, God. Then he took me to Genesis and pointed at the first Adam. He said the first Adam messed up in the garden. But I'm so glad that Jesus didn't act like the first Adam. The first Adam disconnected us. The last Adam reconciled us. The first Adam brought wrath. The last Adam brought favor. The first Adam brought death. The last Adam brought life. The first Adam brought sin. The last Adam brought salvation. The first Adam brought sickness. The last Adam brought healing. Is there anybody in here that thank God for the last Adam? What's his name, y'all? Look at somebody. Say the last Adam brought me power. I can't go on y'all. But I got power. And his passion. It released the power. I'm so glad y'all. That Jesus didn't die from the whip. He died for the world. He didn't die from the nails but he died for my need he didn't die cause he had to he died cause he wanted to and he died when he got ready he said no man takes my life when I'm ready I'll lay it down and I'll die on my own shake your neighbor's hand say neighbor the power of life and death is in your mouth what are you saying don't say die say live don't say poor say rich don't say sick say healed and declare the same power that Jesus had his passion released it to get to me so now I can walk on serpents I can lay hands on the sick and they recover if I drink a deadly thing I will not die cause his passion gave me power anybody in here got some real power touch about three people and say power 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 That 
was cute. That was cute for some of y'all. But I need you to do it again. And when you do it this time, whatever they have need of, I feel a release. I feel a shift. Whatever they've been praying for, when you touch them and say power, the devil got to let it go. The devil got to loose it. The devil got to free it. Find somebody and say power, power, Tell him release it, release it, release it, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, I got power. I don't hear you in here, Messiahs, I got power. You think I'm going to sit here and die? The devil is a liar. I got too much power. Tell somebody I got too much power. The disciples didn't realize what they had. His passion released the power. And when Jesus was ascending back to the Father, they were doing this. As if to say, there goes the best years of our life. As if to say, we have nothing else to look forward to. And the angel had to come and tell him, why sit ye here gazing? God told me to tell 30 y'all, quit gazing and go get your power back. Look at somebody and say, stop looking and go get your power. 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 Holy Ghost power. Healing power. Saving power. Open your mouth and say power. I feel the move of the Holy Ghost right now. God said there are two things. That some of us need in here. He said, one, somebody needs to be filled with my power. He said, number two, somebody needs to be refreshed by my power. I want both groups to meet me down here quickly. Move quickly. I need to be refreshed or I need to be filled. I need to be filled. I need to be refreshed. You can't fight the devil on your strength. But when you get some Holy Ghost power in you. You can declare no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. I need you to come. I feel you pulling on me. Come. I need to be filled with it. His spirit. I need to be refreshed by his spirit. God bless you, sis. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need to be. You let them know. Let these ministers know. I need to be filled or I need to be refreshed. I need to be filled. I need to be refreshed. Come on. With this power. Well, preacher, if I go up there, people are going to look at me crazy because I've been saved a long time. It's going to be people in hell that's been coming to church a long time because they negated the power. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care. When it comes to my walk with God, I got to have it right. I said, I got to have it right. Well, I thought he had to, no. There have been times as a preacher, during the altar call, I've gone up myself and say, Lord, I need you to touch me once again. 
I don't care what these folk think about me. They don't know what I got to struggle with on Monday. They don't know the issues I have on Wednesday. So I need you to refresh.